Welcome everybody. Um, I hope people enjoyed that music. I certainly did. It's a nice way to start my day and a nice way to welcome um, all of you um, for today's discussion. Um, as you can see, um, we are here to discuss um, building what it takes to building uh, to build a clean cooking coalition. And um, as many and of you know, the Clean Cooking Alliance uh, started this journey to create a sector strategy for the clean cooking sector several months ago. And we are just delighted to um, host the panelists and host all of you for this discussion today. Um, my name is Dimfna van der Lans. For those of you who don't know me, I am the CEO of the Clean Cooking Alliance and I will be moderating today's panel. Um, I want to start off by thanking Lindsay and Simiksha, um, who you see here as well, who've been working really tirelessly for the last couple of months on the clean cooking sector strategy and including on this very exciting panel and our opportunity to bring in some new um, ways of thinking into the clean cooking sector and some new voices. And um, I want to start off by reflecting that I firmly believe that one individual doesn't hold the whole space and one organization doesn't hold the whole space. And so I am really eager to be humble in our invitation to, to listen to these voices and to, to ask them to share their um, observations, their insights, their aspirations, their failures, their successes, because if we don't listen to these other sectors with um, a deep reflection, Action, I think we could be missing something. And the exciting part about the clean cooking sector strategy, at least for me, and I hope for many of you, is that there is an opportunity for us to explore new ways um, of engaging with, with other adjacent sectors. And I, I know as, an, as a sector, we've tried this and we, we achieve and aspire to it. Um, and we have done so for many years, for 10 years. I really have tried to engage with the health sector, for example, and Helen and I will speak a little bit to how that has gone and, and how that has worked in a little while. Um, and so not suggesting that, that it hasn't been done, but more an observation around, I actually think we can do better collectively. I think we can be stronger and more collaborative and, and just more innovative in how we think about it. And so these sectors, although they may feel a little adjacent, are actually quite um, connected. And so if you think about it, the sector that we have, uh, sectors that we have represented today, so the health sector, the climate sector, the clean energy sector, although we say they're adjacent, they're really quite interconnected because the ultimate goal for many of these participants is to create healthy and um, resilient households. And so ultimately we are all serving um, the same intentions and the same goals. And so wanna bring those conversations closer together. Um, with a deep appreciation for the need for more integration and more collaboration across these sectors. Um, and so this is really what this, this conversation is. We're going to explore what that means. These things are easy to say, um, and I say it a lot. I'm very aware of that. I say we need to collaborate more and we need partnerships. But what does that actually mean? And, and, and let's be honest about the challenges of how difficult that is, because there's competing interest around funding and competing interest about what needs to be delivered for those funders. So just want to be really honest and really grounded in it's easy to say and, and really much more difficult to do. And so um, acknowledging the fact that this is the first of many conversations um, and we're hoping to do more of these um, in the near future with other sectors um, and other sort of um, ways of thinking about integration um, with other partners um, out there. And so look out for more invitations. Um, let us know if this is interesting. Let us know if this works. Let us know if these are the voices you would like to hear from, what other voices you would like to hear from. We welcome any and all feedback. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just really excited um, about this conversation and we'll We'll get it started um, shortly. And so I'm going to introduce the panelists real quick. Um, so we are honored to be joined by um, Dr. Helen uh, Patik. Helen's a senior science, science advisor for the Bureau of Global, Global Health at USAID and serves as the Bureau's point of contact for household air pollution. Um, Helen's work has focused on quantitative and evidence-based approaches to improving health. So welcome, Helen. We're delighted to hear um, joining us today. Um, we're also joined by Sloka Nath. Sloka is the Head of Sustainability and Special Projects and Head of Policy and Advocacy at Tata Trust. 
Um, at Tada, she focuses on the organization's work on climate, energy, and environment. And she is implementing and funding sustainable and scalable solutions that help both people and nature thrive in India. She's also the executive director of the India Climate Collaborative, an India-led platform founded in 2018 by a group of philanthropies interested in continuing to accelerate India's development while also exceeding its climate goals. So really honored that you're joining us um, today as well, Sloka. Um, and then we're joined by Adamola Adasina. Adamola is the founder and CEO of Rensource, a leading provider of energy and payment services to SMEs in West Africa, working with entrepreneurial management teams in challenging operating environments. Um, he has focused on building and or turning around early and growth stage enterprises um, for most of his career. So welcome and we're delighted that you're joining us as well. And then finally, Dr. Elsie Onsango. Elsie is the center manager um, Kenya at LDE Center for Frugal Innovations in Africa. Um, she's associated with Navoni Research Institute um, based in um, Nairobi and Kenya. Um, and um, she works really on sort of focusing her research on bottom-up frugal innovations in energy access, healthcare, agro, food, and water systems. And so we'll bring a really deep understanding of systems thinking and how these interconnections actually show up in, in all of the work that we're doing. And so really honored that you're joining us as well, um, Elsie. So we'll dive right in. We'll have conversations with each of these panelists for about 10 minutes. Um, please, please feel free to use the chats function to start sharing questions um, that Lindsay and Samiksha will then receive. Either message them directly or use the chat function. And then towards the end, we will try to bring as many of those as we can um, back to the whole panel and, and have um, an interactive conversation towards the end. So with that, um, unless I'm forgetting anything, Samiksha or Lindsay, no. Nope. With that, um, maybe we can start with you, Helen. Um, always wonderful to see you. Um, and I am sorry we have not been able to connect more often and see each other in person, obviously, but I'm really happy to see your face today. Um, and so I want to start a conversation, exploration really with you around health sector and the clean cooking sector and just sort of start off by acknowledging that, that we have tried for many, many years and, and you're leading many of these efforts. Um, and so I think have had some successes, but probably not as much success as we want to. And so it consists of the fact that when I, as an outsider, look at the health sector, it appears quite established. Like there are funders who fund certain things there are, and certain organizations and certain impacts and certain health um, programs. And so not suggesting it's rigid per se, but it seems quite determined almost. Like it's it's set, it's, it's almost like, how do you get in when it's so, clear in what it wants to do and how it thinks about achieving those goals. And so really want to explore a little bit with you, like how do we think about those narratives and adjusting that um, so that we can uh, become more collaborative um, with the health sector going forward. And so my first question to you, Helen, is like, how is the clean cooking sector viewed by the health sector? What is, what's our reputation? How do people in the health sector talk about um, clean cooking and why is it so challenging, has it been so challenging to embed that access to clean cooking more centrally in areas of health? Yeah, Demta, you asked some great questions and I'm delighted to be here with you today because I think this is a really important conversation and glad to see that health is being profiled as one of these adjacent sectors, always thrilled to be on the agenda. <laughs> so maybe just to start talking about health just briefly and then transition to the question that you exactly asked. So I think of health as being a very central ally in this topic of clean cooking, but not because of clean cooking, but because of the clean air that results from clean cooking, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the tricky parts in the conversation that has happened around clean cooking, and before that it was really around clean cook stoves, is that that word, cooking and cook stoves, doesn't really resonate with the health sector. It's what you get from that. It's this clean air that you're going to get that really matters. And so when I think about the health sector, the health sector is really busy, right? There's lots of discussion about all the different diseases people have, both chronic and acute. There's the discussions about what will we do about vaccines? I mean, you guys know the litany of discussion that's going on in the health sector. 
And so to add something else is actually tricky, right? You're coming and you're asking someone who's already full, they're incredibly busy, we're always short staffed on the health side when you go into a clinic and you're saying, can, can you just add one more thing? We've got another thing for your agenda. So I think if we want to involve the health sector more, we've got to be really efficient and really hit the aspects that matter to the health sector. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about those, there's a couple of things that come to mind right away that have happened in the past that maybe we could change a little bit and morph them and make them work a little bit better for us moving forward. But I think one of the issues is that we see one patient at a time we're a one patient treatment and then we move on to our next one patient, but global health wants to see millions of patients be served. So that scale issue going from the onesies to the millions is tricky. So the efficiency piece comes from, if we go in and we wanna talk about just a clean cook stove, wow, that's adding you know, another little tiny thing to this huge list. What if instead we approached it around something like healthy households? where instead of pulling out the little bit of clean cooking, we add on to something that's a big topic. We want sanitation, we want waste management, we don't want you burning trash in your backyard, we'd like you to clean cook. All of those things are gonna impact this thing called a healthy household. And there's been some thinking that if we could attach ourselves to something a little bit more substantive, maybe that would have resonate more than coming in with just one more little addition. So just at the very outset, I feel like the framing has been a bit tricky. Uh, but yeah, let's carry on with this discussion and come back to some of these solutions. Yeah, and so um, I think it's it's really interesting. And this tension between the one and the millions, I think, is is obviously there for health practitioners, but it's also there for other uh, people that engage with the households. Right? It's it's a broader theme that I think could sort of show up um, with other conversations as well. And so. Um, I think from, from your perspective, do you think there are some unintended consequences about how we have historically engaged with the health sector? Like, do we, do we need to overcome a hurdle first before actually the reframing can happen? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, that's a great question. I think one thing that is certainly relevant is if we think about this from the health perspective, the health perspective is all about the quality of air that uh, an individual is exposed to. And so whether that comes from the household or the ambient conditions outside doesn't actually matter, right? All of these mm -hmm. are Im impacting somebody's health. So sometimes it is a bit tricky if you're the practitioner to be separating how somebody is thinking through uh, levels and numbers that are household air pollution versus ambient air pollution. And I think most of, of you are familiar with the notion that whatever you do in the household that contributes to the ambient air pollution for the entire community. And maybe what we need to do is think of ourselves as part of this very big picture, which is the ambient air pollution piece and say, you know, household air pollution is 20 to 50%, depending on where you're located of the ambient air pollution burden. Maybe we should be thinking about that whole continuum. So I feel like it's not exactly intended, unintended consequences, mm -hmm. but it's perhaps a missed opportunity by staying so focused on clean cooking and so focused on the household and maybe not recognizing that we're actually part of a, big, a bigger issue and linking ourselves to that bigger issue. So I like the idea that there have been some recent studies to really show how household air pollution links to ambient air pollution and that it really is a, a huge component that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so with that, how do you, how would you sort of suggest um, the clean cooking sector thinks about sort of the uh, differentiation between like how we engage with the health ministers versus some of the practitioners or even like some of the, the um, like the village health workers, like there are different layers, obviously within the health system that we should think about as well. And so have you seen some examples where that, that actually is starting to be more um, collaborative or more linked? Yeah, you bring up a great point, which is how exactly are we going to link between these different sectors and how do we make use of this burgeoning health sector? So there are a few thoughts that come to mind, things that have been done and things that have been discussed that I think we should put on the table. Mm -hmm. One of those is that everyone needs incentives, right? We're all very busy and we need to be incentivized to move towards a particular solution. So one thing that has come forward is if you were to think about something like practitioner training and vital strategies mm -hmm. and others have been involved in these. You probably are aware and many others that in the medical profession, even far down in the practitioner sort of strata, 
there is a requirement for continuing professional development, right? CPD credits, as they're called. And there's an opportunity to be able to put the discussion around air quality, which would include the clean cooking sector, into those CPDs, right? So there's actually a tangible reason why I, as a practitioner, need to attend this. Mm -hmm. We also know there are certain leverage points. We know that people care deeply about children, right? Uh, many times we'll forgo our own health, but we would never forgo our children's health. And I think that's a worldwide theme. I don't think that's even particularly cultural. We care deeply about children and the next generation. Yeah. So it seems like if we were to think about a group that we wanna impact, National Pediatrics Associations. Those are associations whose goal is to bring a critical mass and a voice to new issues, uh, to create campaigns, to think about how to influence policies. So if I were to choose one of the many associations that you could put effort into, I would choose the Pediatrics Association, right? We know that uh, air pollution has an impact on child pneumonia. We know that pe people care deeply about kids. We know they care deeply yeah. about babies, it impacts birth weight. So those are very tangible ways to be able to move forward. Something we noticed in the hazy perceptions report that some of you may have read from Vital Strategies was that they had recognized that people would understand acute issues. Oh, I'm getting asthma, I'm coughing, mm -hmm. I'm wheezing, but did not think lots about the chronic long-term impacts, which again goes back to this gap of those are the most important ones from our perspective, right? We want to be able to prevent some of the long-term recurrent bouts of pneumonia and so on. And that's something that people are not necessarily recognizing. The Clean Air Fund found that health foundations, which I think is really what you're getting at here, mm -hmm. are only putting in about 3% of the grants, right? They're only 3% only of them are really associated with health foundations. The rest are going to other elements. So these are all places that we need to take a very proactive approach to going after them. I think those are really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that the narrative around like the the nobody, everybody wants to take care of the children, like that narrative around and how we engage with the pediatric association as the mother of a 50 year old <laughs> is right behind me. I, I resonates very strongly with me as well. Um, there's lots more to explore, obviously, Helen, um, and very conscious of the fact that this is the first of hopefully many of these conversations. But if that is OK, I would um, welcome the opportunity to move on to um, Sloka. And so really wonderful to have you join us as well. Um, I am so impressed with your background and just how much you've already achieved. And as somebody who comes from the climate sector, I have always been wondering, like, how can we bring that level of energy and passion and, and dedication and sort of ability to create coalitions that I think have actually been quite strong in the climate sector. How can we bring that to the, uh, the clean cooking sector and not suggesting that building coalitions is easy at all. And I would really welcome your observations there, Shloka, but necessary. And so that is the hard work I think that's, that's ahead of us that we should explore. And so we've seen so much traction in climate issues. Um, it's gained a lot of traction on the political, sort of more political motivation, more public engagement. Um, and so we really want to explore opportunities, like how can we, what, what can we do to elevate the issue of clean cooking within the climate space? Um, and right now, when I talk to my climate colleagues, they will not immediately go to clean cooking. They ask me, like, why are you working on clean cook? Why are you there? <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I am delighted to be here. And, I, and I, I, it's amazing work. But I get that question from people who are in the climate space. And so yeah. Loka, maybe my first question for you is like, why is that? And, and what do you think we can do to sort of elevate the issue of within the clean or within the, the climate space? Well, um, thank you for that. And thank you for the questions. I think it's a very unfair question to ask you, you know, as to why you're doing this. If there's an obvious connect, I think, um, I think the issue really is that there is no clear agenda to connect it to climate change. Um, so unlike air pollution, which is an example I keep coming to because it's sort of been co-opted by the climate community, um, you know, the reason being because it's so directly related to fossil fuel usage, um, you know, um, in, um, in cities as well as coal power plants, whether it's vehicular use or, or you know, just um, double burning or whatever it may be. But clean cooking that actually advocates for LPG as a replacement can't actually come under the climate agenda. So I think okay. there's that piece which is an obvious disconnect. And I just want to say, you know, the, the women who are currently cooking with biofuel, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not their fault. Um, you know, LPG is better for their health. Um, so just to put, put forward sort of a point of, you know, a reference to frame that answer, it is 
the responsibility really is on us to sort of provide mm-hmm. usable solar rather than looking down on LPG for clean cooking because it's not climate friendly. Um, and so we have to kind of step up and put forward that solution and innovate towards it and you know make strides in achieving it. Having said that, I think moving on to sort of the second part of your question, which was really about how do we elevate the clean cooking mm-hmm. or how do we elevate clean cooking as part of the climate agenda? Um, again, as I said, you know, it's, it's focusing on solar and electric over LPG. And I think a few ways to do that actually are, you know, firstly, strengthening the supply infrastructure for electric cooking. So looking at rural distribution transformers, um, you know, they are not designed to take this kind of load, especially the sizable number of electric cooking devices are switched on at the same time during evening peak hours. So to give you an example, um, there's a need for really reliable electricity to switch on, you know, or to switch to induction stores rather. Mm -hmm. Um, So we need to provide electricity at the very least at the parts of the day when cooking needs to happen. So Terry in India, the Energy Resources Institute actually carried out an impact assessment in a Northern state um, where it disseminated 4,000 induction stoves. And even in a state like Himachal Pradesh with very high electrification and good economic indicators, the study actually showed that only 5% of households shifted from traditional mud stoves to induction stoves. And 52% of the households continue to use traditional stoves for primary cooking. And the 5% um, of those households that shifted from traditional to induction uh, did so because of the availability of reliable electricity. So we have to view these solutions in context rather than you know, isolated or siloed mm-hmm. interventions. I think the second thing to sort of um, point out is the need to really make available, you know, low wattage, high efficient um, or high efficiency electrical cooking appliances that consume much like much less electricity and can actually be coupled with a sort of nominal sized solar panel if needed. Um, you know, just to give you an example, the current models of electric cooking devices, they really require large scale solar capacity. And so they have very um, large initial investments. So an unconnected household, again, to give you an example, it gets, you know, a 200 watt peak solar panel. Um, Whereas a one kilowatt peak plus capacity is what's needed for cooking alone. So those are just some of the challenges that we have to kind of address if, you know, we want to move it sort of into the climate agenda, as I said, and, you know, electrification Mm -hmm. is a big piece. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'll pause here because I know you have other questions. No, absolutely. And I I think they're all valid points. And and I know Elsie and others are deep into researching and making sure that sort of um, just electrification and, and how it's connected to, to uh, clean cooking is like really moving forward in, in an appropriate manner. And, and lots of work is being done in that space that we're very excited about. And I think there's great opportunities and to link it back to the climate sector, like indeed, like, you know, if we're working with a, a country like Nepal, if they go to renewable energy for, to power their grids, then that is a really good, suggestion are a really good movement and we need to think carefully about how they then draw down that load and and yeah. I think we'll talk a little bit with Adamola about that as well and like how do we start bundling some of these households uh, level um, energy needs and and mm-hmm. how we can think about that and so maybe a little bit um, Sloka with your sort of experience in building coalitions in India mm-hmm. um, if you can share a little bit with um, the audience about how that worked and what the challenges were and you've been successful in mobilizing sort of this coalition in India and so what can we as a clean cooking sector learn from how you build that space on, on climate um, in India but also more broadly I guess. Sure I mean it's 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 um, it's not an easy answer but um, there are some obvious sort of I think lessons that we learned along the way and I think the first point is that coalitions have to be built to bring different stakeholders together to solve intersectional issues. So it's really useful um, in connecting funders for projects on the ground to providers um, you know coalitions or collaboratives also really Um, help intermediaries facilitate those connections. And what we're really finding in most of these sort of challenges, whether it's clean cooking or the climate agenda more broadly is that there are broken ecosystems that we're dealing Uh with um, and very sort of disconnected and disparate actors. Um, And so you're really looking to build capacity to strengthen the ecosystem when you build a coalition like this. And that means you have to identify what gaps need to be filled, how it can be done. You have to map stakeholders, um, you know, who can play a key role where, 
And I think it also boils down to sort of building inclusive communities. You know, you have to frame issues which really matter to them. So I think, again, to give you a very good example, when it comes to climate change, uh, floods are a great way to communicate rising threats to vulnerable communities who may not be familiar with the sort of nitty gritty of climate science. Um, conversely, it could also take, you know, framing a very pertinent issue through a different lens, you know, altogether, whether it's air pollution or gender. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's particularly relevant as well, of course, for the clean cooking uh, movement. And I think finally, the point on sort of coalitions that's most important is really how they provide the intersectionality of social issues. So uh, again, to give you an example, the likelihood of a poor person being exposed to environmental risks or gender inequality or color discrimination is much higher. And it allows us to frame existing issues through what target audiences really perceive as immediate. And that's kind of the way you sort of push that agenda forward. You know, at the end of the day, you have to define sort of... Uh, a collective North Star, but mm -hmm. everyone has different entry points as well. Um, and I think that was really key for us right at the start of like building the India Climate Collaborative was no, to build yeah. a big enough tent for everyone. Yeah, no, I think that resonates really um, strongly. And I think it's, it's, it's very much part of the ethos of how we're engaging on the clean cooking sector strategy, right? It is this mapping, it is figuring out what those interconnections are. And, I think from our perspective, it's also providing increasing clarity about who does what and, yes. and else is not being done right now and who can step into that space to, to move the okay. ecosystem forward. And so I think that that's a really um, valid point and I look forward to talking a little bit more with you about that, Elsie, as well. Um, the other thing I just want to sort of draw on is like Helen's observation around capacity for healthcare workers and your observation around capacity for just anybody else who's doing these, these issues that are really driven by societal justice and, and just climate justice. And like to acknowledge like people are overwhelmed already and how do we like really be sort of, you know, respectful in, in how we engage with um, people and, and actors in the sector going forward. So thank you so much for that. If um, that is okay, I would like to um, move on to, um, Adamo Lassa, we're really honored to have you join us as well. Um, I have worked in clean energy for most of my career and I'm so super excited about what you have been doing already and how you're working with entrepreneurs and really building out different business models. And so in a way, it's sometimes the easiest connection I think to make because um, clean cooking and clean energy feels super connected already. Um, but sort of the, the possibility, I think, for us as a sector to what people refer to as like riding the electrification wave seems an easy thing to do. And yet I think comes still with quite a lot of challenges um, at the moment. And so I really want to explore a little bit with you, like <clears throat> they're, they're as much as people, I think, think they're one and the same. They're really not. They're very distinct still. And so how do we integrate while keeping sort of focus on different um, dynamics in both of those part of the, the clean or the clean energy sector. Um, and I think we do can, we, we, like we really can learn a lot. And so looking forward to starting that exploration with you. And so my first question for you is sort of in the last five years, there really have been some exciting developments that we've seen in the clean energy space. And so where is the sector today with regards to that feasibility that was already um, discussed a little bit with more integration with clean cooking. What are your observations? What have you seen? What gets you excited? Oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think that the, the first thing I would point to is just scale. Um, in the last five years, we've seen, you know, at least three or four you know, major um, SHS companies um, build distribution channels um, beyond single country efforts. You know, there are now quite a few that are operating regionally or, or even, you know, um, or even beyond. Um, and I think that, um, you know, building distribution around scale um, has been, you know, the biggest development. I think standardization of the supply chain and the technology as well, so that um, the differentiation these days comes less from the tech and more from actually innovations around distribution. Um, and I think you'll, you'll continue to see more and more of that. I think one of the big bifurcations, that at least um, I've noticed in West Africa, is that you're, you're seeing um, you know, two very distinct models of, dis of, um, of distribution. You mm -hmm. have quite a few companies that are sort of offering um, a relatively expensive um, um, products, um, but all under long-term payment plans, you know, several years sometimes. Um, 
and then perhaps more moderately priced um, or, or I should say aggressively priced um, um, offerings that are being sold outright um, or under short-term payment plans, which are, I think, uh, addressing you know, um, similar, similar parts of the market. Um, but when I think of the, the intersections between clean energy and, um, and mm -hmm. clean cooking stove, I, I think a lot of it, from my perspective, would have to be around distribution. Um, you know, how can one, um, you, know, you know, integrate supply chains, um, you know, educate the clean energy sector around the relevance of, um, of, of, of appropriate technology. Um, but, but I would also agree that, you know, there's very little understanding, at least from my side, around, mm -hmm. you know, where the technology stands, how it would fit into existing um, technology on the SHS side, or whether perhaps it's too large and fits more with the mini grid markets, which is also growing quite, quite, quite a bit, um, uh, at least on the African side. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think <clears throat> there's already so much, I think, that can be learned from the clean cooking sector and, and the sector you're currently in around sort of how do you grow your business either regionally or by offering more products? And so that, that bundling, I think, um, is something that we know from the, the companies that we're working with, we see a lot more of, and they're really exploring that. And so I think yeah. distribution and making sure we reach those households with a suite of options um, is something that I think could be really exciting for those sectors and, and the players, the companies within those sectors to continue to just grow their, their margins and their, their sales and their revenues going forward. So I think there's definitely great option, um, option there. Um, and so we see it as also like an important option, the, the bundling for electric cooking. So what are some of the sort of the tactical things that you've learned um, within the sector that have worked around that bundling and, and anything that you can sh share there about solutions to actually scale that for some of the companies? Sure. I mean, I, I think um, a lot of the bundling that we've seen really become the standard now. I think it's rare to find um, SHS being sold um, by themselves or independently. But a lot of that has been driven, I think, um, by collaboration um, from, the, uh, from the supply chain and the technology providers. I think, um, you know, I think we're, we're at a stage in the SHS market now where, um, you know, the, the, the technology is quite commoditized and, and it's quite standardized and it's rare to see real differentiation. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, the use of associations, whether it be on the distribution side or on the technology side, um, to standardize, um, you know, knowledge dissemination around technology. I mean, I'll, I'll point to, for example, the, the, uh, the lighting global standards um, mm -hmm. and how that's brought a lot of transparency around um, one, both the quality, but also the, the universe um, of the of ecosystem of different, different um, types of technology. So I think trying to find those um, you know, those actors that can kind of bring people together around knowledge dissemination and just um, education around um, the tech um, and, and, and how it might fit or not fit, I think would be a good starting point. Yeah, and have you seen associations that are really effective in sort of more the advocacy and lobbying side and how has that played into sort of continuing to, to strengthen the industry? Yeah, and I think there's a real distinction between um, often, you know, very global organizations that may have a lot of you know, reach and um, be plugged into the, the more typical you know, donor networks, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. uh, versus very localized organizations that may have you know, a bit more of their air to the ground and know, um, you know, know yeah. um, what may be more relevant on the ground um, w without the full insights of what's happening globally. But I think some organizations, you know, you know, are are kind of uh, you know, bridging both worlds. You know, I, I think of um, global groups like um, like Power for All, um, mm -hmm. or even the the, the UN Desi for All initiative. Um, I think um, there is uh, something called the African Mini Grid Developers Association mm -hmm. that, that has um, local um, local representations in you know, most of the relevant countries. So I think there are there are quite a few examples um, of of, or of associations that are bridging both worlds. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's another sort of theme and transition pathway that's emerging from the clean cooking sector strategy work, which is like how a little bit of that sort of tension, how do you hold global versus local or, or at a country level, or even regional? And, and I think some of the free trade options that are emerging in Africa are really interesting for us to look into as well. And how do associations really strengthen that sort of the advocacy, the lobbying on the policy side to make sure that yeah. what this is really neat is a predictable policy environment. Once it's predictable, you can build your businesses around it, but it doesn't help if it's unpredictable and it moves around and, and then all of a sudden you're faced with 
quite significant business disruption. So I think sort of as a emerging sector, and we're still quite nascent to learn from how that has worked with other sectors in the energy sp space could be really interesting and should indeed be something that we explore um, together. Indeed, yeah. Great, so if um, that's okay, I'm gonna move on uh, Ademola and make sure that we um, have enough time also for Elsie. And so really nice that you are joining us too, as well from Nairobi, Elsie, and so delighted to see you. Um, really wanted to sort of have a conversation a little bit with you around why are we actually talking about systems and what do we actually mean when we talk about systems? And as somebody who's been trained in systems, and thinking and systems dynamics and work with Professor Sturman at MIT and others who are really big systems thinkers. It's language that's really comfortable to me, but may not necessarily be something that we hear a lot about within uh, the clean cooking sector. And so <clears throat> I want to start with you, Elsie, and see if you can um, sort of speak a little bit more to what do we actually mean when we talk about systems and, and, and sort of how does that show up in the work that we're doing? Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I think that um, the preceding act, uh, speakers have also talked about this, uh, different elements of what a system would be and how those systems seem to be working within their sectors. And I'll premise this by saying that academics are still also debating about what a system is. So depending on which school of thought you subscribe to, you might find a different definition. For someone like me who focuses on innovation studies, who looks at the role of technology, and how people organize themselves around technology, um, how that influences, how systems change. And a system is defined in terms of a set of components which are working together, which are interacting together. And these components um, actors or what um, would be called stakeholders who play different roles within that particular setting. These actors are governed by certain institutions or certain rules or what have, have been referred to as rules of the game, which could be norms, expectations, attitudes, value systems that they have that determine how they interact when they interact and even determine the power relations within the system. Uh, it became increasingly clear, um, especially among innovation researchers, that technologies or artifacts or material elements, tangible things are a core part of systems because they, in a way, shape how human beings interact, how they work mm -hmm. together, and what they're able to do and what they're not able to do. So in fact, there's a whole um, bunch of, um, a school of thought that looks at technologies acting, having agency, almost being like humans, yeah, after mm -hmm. after network theory. So then for me, those three elements um, characterize a system and they work together, they interact, and they're of course in a certain context. And in every, any given setting, you'll find multiple systems uh, that coexist, co-evolve. Sometimes they conflict, sometimes they compete. And I think that's very clear, mm -hmm. even in clean cooking. The fact that we're talking about clean cooking already, we are defining the boundaries. It yeah. means there is unclean cooking and there's a whole system built around there. And usually a set of systems built around the technologies that are used there. Um, so then it's important to recognize that uh, these dynamics exist, not just within the system that we are placed in, but a variety of systems that actually are working together or sometimes undermining each other. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's complicated. Systems are complicated. <laughs> systems within the systems and how they interact with others is, is you can keep going, obviously, for a very long time. I think maybe sort of how do you, with the sort of the holding that complexity, how do you keep the end users at the center of all of the work that we're doing. How have you seen that um, show up in some of the work that you're looking at? That is a big challenge, I must say, to today. Um, we know historically that, especially engineers and scientists, you know, um, typically marginalized end users or only mined information from end users to feed into their technology development processes or their R&D processes. And we've seen failures in systems due to that approach, which mm -hmm. assumes the end user is um, um, passive. But we have known increasingly that they have agency. They can resist an intervention. Mm -hmm. They can participate. They can own it. They can give it legitimacy. And to be able to develop a system in which end users feel part and parcel of it, then end users have to participate in that system from the get-go. Yeah, usually 
uh, when you're talking about inclusion and exclusion, uh, particularly in that literature, there's always this discussion about at what point do you involve end users who tend to be marginalized. And even the terminology right. end users also has its own connotation that they yeah. come at the end. Yeah. And so then changing that narrative to thinking about households, um, people mm -hmm. who use our products, uh, who use, who but benefit from the interventions that are made, whether by policymakers, by corporations, by startups, um, have a voice and they need to be incorporated from the get-go and creating yeah. that platform for them to participate in technology development processes, in policy processes, in developing strategies um, for them, for their voice to be heard. Capacity building has been mentioned and sometimes you find that, especially if you're dealing with end users that have been marginalized, they lack a mechanism for being able to engage, especially, especially if you feel like you're engaging with you know, highly learned elite actors who yeah. tend to be the ones who set their agenda. So there has to be some investment in that regard to enable them to articulate their perspectives yeah. so that they can be taken into consideration. Yeah, no, I think that's really well put, Elsie. And, and uh, it's one of the other themes that's emerging from the work with the clean cooking sector strategy um, process. That, like really, how do we think about the households um, and make sure that we design, not design things around that, but like really hold that at the core of the work that, that all of us are doing. And so I think that's a really nice way, if that's okay, Elsie, to sort of wrap up sort of the immediate questions. I am super conscious of our time and could obviously talk to each of you for an hour at least, if not for a day or weeks. Um, but I've also seen quite a lot of questions coming up. And so one, two, if that is okay with all of you, um, humbly suggest that I turn it to Sumiksha and or Lindsay to share some of those questions and um, really want to sort of make sure that we get to some of them. There were some really good ones in there. So Great, thank you, Dukna. Um, one of the first questions that we got was wanting to hear a little bit more from each of the panelists about the distinction and tension between global advocacy efforts and more local or national efforts um, and where people may think that clean cooking advocates should focus more. Who wants to? Shoka, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, the most relevant example really is air pollution um, because it just framed the issue so strongly. Um, and I think actually what's really interesting about air pollution is that, um, you know, it, it really wasn't about um, climate change. Um, and that's the really unexpected thing is that, in fact, climate change wasn't mentioned at all in most cases. Um, but what they did do was they really framed a narrative around a, a particular issue that, you know, everyone could experience daily. It was negatively impacting their lives. Um, but it did require a lot of action in terms of educating the population about what the dangers of those pollutants were. Um, and just a couple of sort of things off the top of my head, because I, I, I want to move quickly because of time. But, you know, the one thing that they did very well was identify and target specific audiences. So, for instance, uh, groups like Warrior Mums or Mothers for Clean Air, mm. they were very successful in activating mothers across India on air pollution and its impact on their children's health. So I think it's really crucial to tailor the call to action for the target group. Um, mm -hmm. The second is they used a lot of sort of visual evidence-based communication. So for instance, it was very impactful to see how quickly things like physical lung installations turn black in Delhi or in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. um, the third is, you know, very short sort of video-based unbranded communication. It has the mm -hmm. potential to reach a really wide audience. It can communicate a story much better. Again, uh, to give you an example, the Clean Air Collective, you know, they had a, an unbranded campaign, which they put out. Uh, many short and sort of entertaining videos, which were able to achieve mm -hmm. millions of views. Yeah. Um, and they saw a lot of support in social media around that. Um, I think the fourth is drawing on authoritative, authoritative voices. So I would say things, and Helen will agree with this, but like, you know, communities like doctors, you know, they can really help strengthen a health-based message. Um, and the final one is using things like sort of mobile apps, you know, an increasing mm -hmm. number of people are active on the internet. App-based user engagement can actually give local stakeholders a means to connect and act with an issue beyond the traditional sort of one-way communication. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, an organization called Chhatka in India, they were really able to crowdsource pictures of waste burning incidences in the city of Bangalore. And that really went a long way. So to sum up, um, 
three suggestions. You know, messages should always have a call to action um, or you know, very simple specific demands for people to advocate. I would say the second is communicate in local languages. I think this might answer Oren's question, but it's important to reach a really wide audience. Um, and similarly, you must highlight hyper-local issues. Um, mm -hmm. You have to show local campaigns and successes. And the final one is to really diversify beyond catastrophic fear-inducing narratives. Yeah. I think that's something that the climate change sector is still really struggling with. But audiences are much more likely to engage with entertaining or positive messages. So I will pause here. Yeah, thank you. Um, Adamola, I know we, we spoke a little bit about sort of global and, and regional advocacy already, but anything else you want to share? Any, any sort of other ones that come to mind that you think are really powerful and we should explore? Well, I mean, I think um, quite recently, I was at the last 18 months, um, there's a, in Nigeria where I spend a lot of my time, there's a Renewable um, Energy Association of Nigeria that's been very effective in bringing together um, not only the SHS industry, but also mm -hmm. uh, mini grid um, um, companies, as well as um, even elements of the technology supply chain for lobbying, particularly with regards to tariffs, uh, yeah. import duties, and just re regulatory efforts. Um, so, I mean, I would definitely have a closer look at what they've done. I think yeah. they, and I think they actually work closely with um, another organization whose name I can't quite remember, but that's a, that's kind of a, a Pan-African body from which they draw a lot of insights from. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, can I suggest we move on to another question, unless there's something burning from Helen and, and or Elsie. Okay. Let's move on to another question then. Yeah, so a somewhat related question um, for Helen and Shloka, how have individuals and households specifically elevated their voices to influence the health and climate agendas? Mm -hmm. Helen, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, so I just want to combine this maybe with the last question and frame Great. it a little bit more largely, which is something that we found is that we have really good ideas about solutions, right, and where we want to go. We've talked about how the electrification might drive a particular uh, change in cooking behavior or having the right sorts of uh, devices for cooking might change your behavior and how you carry out cooking. But these are very contextual. They're very context specific. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've thought a lot about from the health sector is what we would call implementation research. And it sort of embodies things like human-centered design and really think about how you have a set of solutions, but you need to tailor them very specifically to the group that you're working with, whether that be households or communities or a particular culture or a particular country, all across, um, we need a certain amount of contextualization. So I'll give one very specific example. We've made huge investments in monitoring air quality, right? We have sensors that people wear, we have uh, sensors on top of embassy buildings in big cities. Mm -hmm. When that information first became available, it was difficult to get people at the beginning to engage, but they became more and more available. They became something that you could click on your phone and stay connected. You could be on it all the time every day and just have a little button come mm -hmm. up in the corner of your uh, phone screen. And we started to put out things like red and yellow and green days. And we really got people very interested in this, right? So people now know they'll talk about, oh, we had five red days in a row this week. And so we've gotten it down to very much the household level to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was a, a huge turning point when people started talking about monitoring and air quality data that would have yeah. been difficult to predict, right? How would we know that that was going to be such a big turning point? And so the idea that we're going to research this and test things and really work on this human-centered interaction is really important to us. Yeah, yeah back to you, Dimpna. Um, I wonder if Elsie, if you want to add something to that, especially sort of the human-centered design and, and our previous conversation around how households are at the center of all of this. Yes, I'm, I'm glad that came up because um, one way of um, incorporating end users or households or communities in such development processes is co-creation and human-centered mm -hmm. design is one way of thinking about co-creation, about collecting what requirements are and really understanding them from the perspective of the communities because what often happens is then they're, they're, they're shaped to fit a certain narrative and then building that into the technology. And I've seen that happen um, here in, in my current research on electric cooking, but also in other areas, in mobile money uh, services mm -hmm. and also in healthcare where communities have very specific needs and they can articulate them quite well about what they want and how they want it. And if that is incorporated in development processes, then they, 
the, the, the possibility of building legitimacy, of getting them to own the solution um, yeah. rises. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lindsay and Simiksha, maybe we have time for one more question. Great. Um, I think a question that could be addressed to each of the panelists was how they see the impact of COVID um, integrating into uh, clean cooking and how that would affect their sectors and, and our ability to actually engage with their sectors as well, or how COVID, uh, what implications they see for COVID in terms of innovation and progress within their sector. This is a big question. So <laughs> get one or two of the panelists to respond to that. Um, who wants to start? I can jump in with just my initial observations. COVID has really disrupted the way we live our lives, including the way we cook, the way we interact with each other. It has disrupted supply chains quite significantly. I've seen that here in Kenya, where it was difficult to import um, certain items. In, in my research, especially, for example, importing electric cook cookers, induction cookers, multi-cookers, etc. And we have to think um, should we continue to rely on these global supply chains that are very vulnerable to such events? Of course, the answer cannot be yes and no. It's a balance between the two. And then getting local stakeholders to start thinking about that seriously, investing in research and development, building in indigenous knowledge, indigenous practices and understandings into developing homegrown solutions that still um, address the clean cooking challenge that we have. Great. Adamola, anything that you want to share from the clean energy sector? Well, I mean, I, I completely agree with Elsie. It's been um, it's been a very difficult year for the whole sector. I think uh, starting with the supply chain hits early in the year, which I think are still mm -hmm. the, the ramifications are still flowing through the system. Um, you know, I think that this will lead to failures as far as you know actual companies going under. I think a lot of that is still being papered over for now, and we'll see how that looks like um, throughout the course of the rest of the year. Um, but it's also forcing us to um, you know, do business differently, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. different supply chains, whether it's more local localization um, or, or just more, um, I guess, you know, better resiliency around planning. Um, I, I think that it's uh, been you know, clearly a negative um, for the industry, but um, you'll, you'll see winners come out of it as well as losers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sloka or Helen, anything else you would like to add to that? Infinite, just uh, one addition. I think it's allowed us to visualize what clean air actually looks like in some places and to be able to appreciate what perhaps has been missing. Mm -hmm. And maybe after a long time of having a lot of air pollution, maybe you forget just how great it would be to have some clean air. And mm -hmm. I think it's really brought focus to how that makes you feel, how that impacts your health on a day-to-day -day basis, how much you can enjoy that clean air. And I think that has been a great asset uh, really to be able to envision something that normally you just dream about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can just add a quick point to Helen, but um, or a quick couple of points. I think you know, looking at it from, again, the air pollution sort of lens, um, you know, we did see as a result of COVID, like an improvement in air quality, like mm -hmm. the percent of pollution did fall across cities. Um, I think also the linkage between COVID um, and the impacts of air pollution, right? So the number of, there were many studies that came out during um, the lockdown, I think one in particular, which they all have to be corroborated, obviously, but uh, one in particular pointed out that, you know, the number of deaths that were avoided in China post the pandemic were mo was more than the lives lost during the pandemic. Um, you know, so there's a lot of sort of evidence and data that I think this time has produced about the unintended consequences of air pollution, you know, on other health effects or shock. I think the third is, and this goes off what Helen said, um, there's an, it also brought in an unintended sort of positive behavior change, which is suddenly people were wearing masks. Um, and we are still, you know, so work from home is also becoming the norm um, and it's changing what essential travel means going forward as well. Uh, waste management, however, in the time of COVID has ob obviously become a lot tougher. So mm -hmm. there are these sort of unintended consequences as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it remains to be seen, but um, I think yeah. that the final point is whether or not we're going to really see sort of um, how public policy is going to move forward and, and in what direction and whether we're going to prioritize things like sort of the ease of doing business over, um, 
you know, uh, the focus on things like air pollution and the allocations yeah. we need to make to sort of solve those problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you um, to all the panelists for their contributions and, and maybe to sort of bring that sort of the last question and the last comments together, like these are incredibly challenging times and I think really um, forced us as well to think about these kind of conversations, right? And so how do we bring in these new voices? How do we bring in new thinking? How do we learn quickly from people like Ademola and Sloka and Elsie and Helen? And how do we really collectively um, like force and, and bring new sense of urgency to this issue because there's 10 years left and impacts like, like what we're seeing right now are just so significant for all of the communities that we're working in that we really need to re refocus and reshift our, our attention to what does it mean to create resiliency at the household level. And so really want to thank everybody who participated, who was on the panel, who did all the prep work beforehand um, for very interesting conversations. Um, I think these things, collaboration, as I said in the beginning, it's easy to say and thinking about systems is, is as a sentence is easy to articulate, but actually doing it is, is really hard work. So very grateful for all of you to be willing to um, engage with us on that, that journey and start that conversation and thank the participants um, as well who were on the call. Um, many of you um, posted really excellent questions and I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but we will definitely capture all of those and follow up as appropriate. Um, want to remind everybody that if you haven't done so already, the survey is still open for the clean cooking sector strategy. So we really, really welcome everybody's feedback and encourage everybody to um, go online and do that. And then um, based on, we'll do a quick poll, but um, we'll, we're hoping to do more of these conversations um, with other sectors and other voices to continue sort of bringing a sense of energy and, and sort of forward looking thinking to the sector. And so look out for those. Um, and with that, Lindsay and or Samiksha, unless I've forgotten something, I am going to ex again extend my gratefulness to all of the panelists um, for joining us from across uh, the globe for this conversation today. And um, yeah, I look forward to continuing um, those conversations with um, all of you in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you very much. <laughs>